One of the amazing things is, I guess I would almost say vibrant nature of the fish, their size, their strength, the fact that they can travel 100, 200 miles without feeding, excavate a large area in gravel, put eggs in it, and rebury that area. If you get in the river with them, the, the size of the fish is astonishing. They have the ability to move swiftly, and the power that they exhibit is just it's just a really vibrant, alive thing. They're doing it all on adrenaline. They're not feeding anymore, and they may or may not know they're going to die, but regardless of whether they do know it, they will die. It's the end of life for them. Chinook salmon travel hundreds of miles from off the coast of California back inland to the freshwater rivers of their birth. After feasting on the wealth of the ocean, they return to these cool, rushing mountain waters where their parents left them as eggs. From the thousands of eggs that each female buries under the gravel, only a few survive to find their way back. Driven by the powerful urge to spawn, Salmon can swim a thousand miles until stopped by barriers, which now are usually man-made. For spawning to be successful, they must first find a place with cold water, between 45 to 58 degrees Fahrenheit, that has a high oxygen content and the right size gravel. When her eggs are ripe, she begins to fan her tail against the river bottom, moving the rocks and sand. Hour after hour, she digs a pit for her eggs, and several males will often gather behind. Out of the group, she accepts one to stay by her side. When her time comes, she releases her eggs into the riverbed, then the male immediately shoots out his sperm. And another cycle of life begins in these eggs, bouncing in the river rocks. Quickly the female begins to cover the eggs and fill the pit back up. This whole process of first digging and then filling her red can take days leaving her battered and exhausted. After days of spirited dashing and digging, the spawning salmon become weak and then die. Their dead bodies set off an explosion of new life at the bottom of the food chain and are a final gift to their offspring. This massive infusion of nutrients into the river triggers the optimal conditions for their newly hatched fry to emerge into a world of temporary abundance. These waves of spawning salmon returning from the ocean also have a great effect on the other plants and animals in their mountain home. Only a few families of fish have the ability to go from fresh water to salt water and back. These fish are called anadromous. After millions of years, their return has transformed their birth streams by bringing back a great gift, nutrients from the ocean. It's kind of a neat thing in a way that this, almost a process called anadromous fish, is a mechanism by which food in the ocean, things in the ocean, nutrient in the ocean is brought back far, far inland and put into a system and becomes part of the system inland. It's really something that most people would find very unexpected. It's one of those little neat things that just, you know, oh, yeah, I mean, that, that fish is almost entirely ocean stuff.
to the point where they still have bacteria on them that adapted for the ocean, you know. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> it's really very little fresh water. They took, you know, this much with them as fresh water nutrient and bring back that much <laughs> as ocean and that's it's kind of a neat thing. Females bringing back all these eggs, and they were created out of food in the ocean. And as they go through their life, there's quite a number of critters that feed off of them. One is during spawning, stray eggs float through the river system, so trout feed on them. And another species, sculpin, actually crawl around under the rocks after the eggs birds flying up and down here. They're here, particularly the mergansers, because they feed on fish. That's their only source of food. And these areas produce a lot of fish, in part because the salmon bring these nutrients back from the ocean. So they have the young, the fry from Chinook to feed on, but they also feed on the sculpins and rainbow trout that have been feeding on the eggs. So the, the eggs of the Chinook are turning into fish, young fish, old fish in some cases, that become food for the mergansers. The whole system, the biological systems out here, have a large percentage of their material, the components, actually coming from Chinook, which are in fact bringing this from the ocean. So it's just a pretty complex web. As you start to follow just the feeding of these critters through, everything gets overlapped and goes every which way. It's not to say that Chinook are the, the basis for everything that goes on out here, but they function in a role of bringing material from someplace else. You know, basically like a, uh, you know, truck supplying a grocery store. They bring in a, a large supply of material that then gets utilized throughout the whole system. And, you know, the system does produce its own material, but that material that Chinook bring is just a very useful material, particularly in the water, but even outside the water in terms of life systems. You know, it's, it's great food. The entire salmon is almost immediately usable by most critters within the system, whereas if the food is coming from vegetation, the riparian vegetation growing along the rivers. There's only a few critters that can convert that, whereas the salmon, which is just protein and fats, oils, for the most part, it just moves readily into all the different groups. It's the slowest getting to the vegetation, but in the end, it's probably contributing the most to the vegetation, too, because all the animals defecate and die in this area, and so their bodies and their feces contribute to the plants growing, basically make up the soil in the end. How salmon find their way back to the rivers of their birth is a mystery and a great wonder of nature. Salmon, sensitive to the distinct characteristics of the water that they were hatched in, are almost always successful in finding their native stream. After spending two to six years in the ocean, the need to spawn drives them to return to fresh water and begin their final transformation. In a journey that may take many months, they will swim upstream as far as they can in search of places to spawn. Often, waterfalls or dams block their way. The great rivers flowing through the Central Valley of California were once full of Chinook, or king salmon, the largest of the seven species of Pacific salmon. With optimal conditions, they can grow to over four feet long and weigh over a hundred pounds. 
but today in California they normally grow to around three feet long and usually weigh between 15 to 25 pounds. Living on their stored fat, they can swim hundreds of miles upstream without eating, looking for places with the right conditions for spawning. By the time they reach their spawning grounds, their appearance has begun to change. Salmon lose their bright silver coloring and greenish tinted backs and become darker after leaving the ocean. The Chinook males begin to look different from the females as they turn even darker and reddish and their jaws grow longer with hooked tips. So strong is the urge to breed that sometimes the smaller males gathered behind the dominant male will rush up when the female is putting her eggs into the red and try to add their sperm into the mix. After spawning, the female stays over her red until she dies, to guard it from other newly arriving females looking for a place for their reds. Females often fight each other for the ideal places, and during the later part of the spawning season, will often dig up the reds of earlier spawners. This sends eggs and half-developed fry downstream, where they are eaten by other animals. Driven by this competition, females search for unclaimed spawning areas and so expand their range. Each year, some salmon will stray into different rivers or streams. Many will encounter conditions too difficult to spawn in and the straying salmon will die. Sometimes, however, the strays will find conditions suitable for spawning and the stream or river will become part of the salmon habitat. The same behavior allows people to restore habitat along streams and rivers and soon see the salmon returning to use the newly restored area. By traveling far inland to spawn, they put their young out of the reach of the many types of ocean predators that would eat the young salmon. Many salmon streams have little in the way of natural nutrients in them so the adult salmon provide their young with the ultimate sacrifice. As they die, their bodies release all the nutrients and energy obtained in the ocean into the stream's food web. These nutrients feed the food chain of plankton and insects upon which the young salmon feed, allowing the young to survive in great numbers until they are big enough to migrate back into the ocean safely. Because they can go far inland to rivers without enough food for their offspring, salmon were able to quickly recolonize rivers, stripped bare by melting glaciers at the end of the last ice age. These anadromous fish were among the first to return to those barren places, just uncovered by the retreating ice sheets. And the nutrients they brought provide an important boost to the ecosystem. Before contact with Europeans, salmon was also an abundant source of food for the first people living here. About one-fourth of the people in North America lived near salmon rivers, where they formed the largest non-farming communities found anywhere. With the destruction of salmon spawning grounds, a dynamic ecological and economic resource of the region has been greatly harmed. Have we lost this natural wealth forever? If we can heal rather than harm our environment, their decline can be reversed, and we can learn to benefit the ecosystem in the same way as the salmon. <laughs>